This message I've entitled, A Divine Setup, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10 here in the uh, book of Acts. As uh, Luke, who's the writer of this book, he writes and he says this, verse 1 of chapter 3, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, carried uh, whom, uh, was carried whom they had laid at the gate daily, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was the one who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I read a story about an agnostic professor who would visited a primitive tribe that had been impacted by missionaries uh, who brought the gospel to this tribe. And this agnostic professor was having a conversation with the chief of this tribe, and he said this to this chief, it's just a shame that you were duped by those missionaries. Nobody really believes the Bible literally anymore. We're more enlightened than that. Now, the, ch the old chief pointed to the rock that they used to bash in the heads of the people that would eat, and the oven where they would roast them. And he said this to the agnostic professor, if it were not for the gospel message of the love of Jesus Christ, which could convert a cannibal into a Christian, you'd be our supper by now. When I see a changed life, especially when the gospel has touched a life, it reminds me of the power of God. Because the gospel is powerful. The gospel changes minds. The gospel will change a life if you let it. You know, it was Paul the Apostle who confidently said this about the gospel. He said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. This morning, I want to draw your attention to an amazing story in the book of Acts. And it's in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, we're going to see the life of an individual that was radically changed because of the gospel. We see the power of God working in this man's life. Now, Acts chapter 3 is the account, or the, Acts, the book of Acts is the account of the early church. And up to this point in Acts chapter 3, great things were happening in the early church. Let me give you some examples of what was going on. They, they, they experienced great miracles. There was a great miracle in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the early believers and basically ignited a desire, a passion to share the gospel. They were anointed by the Holy Spirit. So we see a great miracle. We also see great preaching. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter's preaching was in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was the first to actually bring forth the first sermon in the book of Acts. Then we also see great conviction. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38, when they, were, when they would share the gospel with the, with the non-Christians, the people would respond by saying, what shall we do? That is a great response. When you share the gospel, I haven't had somebody say that directly. What should I do? And if you do, the, the answer is, well, you need to get right with God. And that was happening. We saw great miracles, great preaching, great conviction, great salvation. Great salvation in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, 3,000 souls were added to the church. It's amazing. But not only that, but there was great hunger. There was a great hunger in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, to continue daily with one accord, to gather together. They, there, was, there was a hunger for unity. And lastly, is a great unity. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, I mentioned that. And then great favor and praises in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. People were added to the church and people were getting along. 
So all we see here is the constant greatness of God. You see God's greatness among the people, and things were happening in a great way. In fact, it's summed up in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, like this. Many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. So Acts chapter 3 is another great example of the power of God, the power of the gospel, the name of Jesus Christ that touches this man's life. So let's look here in our text at verse 1. We see very clearly that the two people involved in this is Peter and John. They were going up to prayer at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now, remember that these two, Peter and John, were trained a little bit more than the other disciples. It was actually Peter, James, and John that you see a lot with Jesus, kind of secluded and, and Jesus teaching them lessons and whatnot because of their prominent role that they would actually take when they would actually go into the, uh, the mission field, when they become church leaders. So these three were actually taught a little bit more, especially Peter and John. Now, what great pair to have in a church, a Peter and a John. Remember, Peter was the outspoken one. He was the bold one. John, remember, he was described as the son of thunder. Remember, Jesus would actually say that, you know what, you guys are really just, your turn or burn ministry is not going to cut it here. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't follow Jesus, then burn, right? That was John. And you have these two guys that Jesus was using in the early church. What great pair to have, a Peter and a John. But there's something else that's interesting that fascinates me about Peter and John, and that is that these two were competitive. Did you know that? These guys were very, very competitive. In fact, it was in John chapter 20, verse 4, when Jesus rose from the dead and the news came to the guys, John says this, so they, ran, they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. I mean, did you know that John is the only one that writes this in all the Gospels? Matthew didn't care. Luke didn't care. Mark didn't care. John did, because he wanted to show that he was faster than Peter. That's a very competitive guy. And you know, I'm sure there are some people here that are very competitive. Don't laugh. You're like, I am. I'm just like that guy. You know, I bet you some of you here probably looked at each other like, I beat you to church, I got here first. These guys were competitive. There was another time where Jesus was talking to Peter about how he was going to die, right? How he would experience death that would bring God glory. And as, Peter, as Jesus is talking to Peter, Peter looks at John and says, well, what about him? Jesus says, don't worry about him. It just, it's, it's, don't worry about how I'm going to work with him. So again, we have Peter and John, competitive in nature, Yet, they're going to gather to the temple to reach the lost, to reach their own people. And notice what time, the ninth hour. What time is that? 3 p.m. 3 p.m., actually, the Jewish people had three different times of prayer. They had prayers at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. The 3 p.m. hour was very critical because that was the sacrifice. That was the, the sacrifice for them to, to bring in their sacrifice to God. So the beggar understood very clearly that this was a very, very important time. Tons of people would come. Now, where would they get this three different kinds of prayer times? Well, I believe, and this is just my speculation, they probably based this out of Psalm 55, verse 17, that says this, Evening and morning and at noon I pray, and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. So we see here from the text that this refers to the evening sacrifice, and we also see that the original followers of Jesus were worshiping Christ in a variety of ways. They would go to the temple, probably on specific days or perhaps daily. They would also go to the local synagogues, and they would gather with the believers on Sunday. All these areas that they would actually hang out were areas of ministry, where they would encourage each other or share the gospel. So this brings us to this man in verse 2. Notice that Luke says, a certain man. No name. It wasn't important to know who this guy was, his name. But it is important for Luke. Remember, Luke is a doctor. It's important for Luke to describe this man's condition in a very interesting way. And he says there very clearly, he says that he was lame from birth. Uh, from birth. He was born in this condition, and he was carried, which basically reveals that his condition was hopeless. This guy couldn't walk at all. He was crippled. And it was here that all of a sudden, Peter and John meet this guy. Now, as you read this story, we automatically think that this guy was already sitting down at the gate. But he wasn't. Notice that he was being carried to the gate. And as he was being carried, Peter and John were walking, and they came together. 
And that's when this man shouted out and asked for money. Now, when, he says, when it says here that he was laid here daily, this reveals his daily routine. His daily routine was to beg at this location. That he was a common person. People saw this guy over and over. In fact, beggars had three favorite places to beg. Uh, the houses of, riches, of rich people, and also not only that, but main highways like we see today, and the temple. So not only at the houses of the rich, not only at major highways, but also the temple, and the temple was their favorite place to go. Why? Well, because it was at the temple that people came to impress God. People came there to give. They were more willing to give. In fact, rabbis taught that there were three pillars for the Jewish faith. The worship, or the Torah, worship, and the showing of kindness, or charity, almsgiving, which was actually a major expression, a major expression of one's devotion to God. And so he knew that some Jews came there just to impress God. Kind of like today. You, know, you have people that give just to kind of feel good. They think that they're impressing God by their giving. That there's no relationship with God. They have no, no, you know, they don't care about Jesus. But there's something inside of them that they just want to give because they just want to be givers, I guess, if you will. Uh, you see that a lot during Christmas time. You have the Salvation Army. You have the Goodwill. They stand out with little bells. And, 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 and you know, a lot of people in America like to give because for some reason maybe they think that, you know, hey, God's going to pat me on the back and say, good job, thank you for giving. Or perhaps they just feel like it's, it's time for a good deed. I haven't done a good deed in a long time. Maybe this will impress God. Here's two bucks. You see, I mean, that's the way it was with the Jewish people. It was a, it was a thing that they were doing. They were going through the motions. It wasn't anything that it was heart done from the heart. It was something that they just went there hoping to impress God by their giving. So this, this guy that's sitting here wanted to get something from the people. And the gate that he's at is called Beautiful. This gate was massive. 75 feet high, and it was made out of solid, fine brass. And it says that it took 20 men to close these gates. It was a huge gate. It was a heavy gate. And, and everything about the temple was glorious. If you know your New Testament uh, history, you know that the temple was a huge thing. In fact, even in the Gospels, there's many references made to the beauty of the temple. For example, in Luke chapter 21, verse 5, then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations. And then in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to show him the building of the temple. So the temple was huge. It was, was magnificent. So what is this guy doing? Notice, he was begging. It was business as usual for this guy. This guy had a normal routine. This was it here. But little did he know that God was about to transform, that God was about to give him a better plan for his life that would totally change his daily routine. You know, this leads me to say this, that sometimes we never know what God may be up to in our lives. And God could be working behind the scenes right now and you have no clue. And maybe you're stuck on this routine. You have a routine. And maybe this morning, God wants to break that routine. He wants to intervene in that routine in your life. And he wants to say, you know what? That routine that you're in is hindering your walk with me. I need to break it. I need you to do something different. And I need you to do it my way. You see, this is something that is important for us to understand in this text. Is that God can interrupt your daily routine at any time. And he has the right to do that. You know, I'm teaching my four-year-old right now not to interrupt mommy and daddy while they're talking. That happens. It's frustrating, right, parents? You're like, stop, I'm talking. But they need to learn. So we have different methods and techniques and how to give her, you know, the, the ability to talk when we're done or whatnot. Well, listen, when God wants to interrupt your life, he has the right to do it. And that is because he sees something in your life that is not doing good, that, that, that something that is not actually moving you forward in your walk with Christ. So he steps in and says, um, I am going to interrupt you here in a moment. I don't like the way you're going. I don't like how you're thinking. God has that plan, that, that, that right. And this is what's happening with this beggar. This guy was used to doing what he was doing on a daily basis, but God was about to intervene in this man's routine. And we see here very clearly that this happens a lot in Scripture. David, a young shepherd boy, taking care of the sheep, 
Little did he know that God was about to break in that routine, in that job of his, and he was going to make him the king of Israel. And then you even have the disciples, Peter, James, John. These guys were fishermen. They all were professionals at catching fish until Jesus showed up and says, you're now going to be fishers of men. So now you're going to change this routine, guys, and now you're going to come after me, you're going to follow me, and now you're going to bear the cross. And we see here very clearly that this beggar is in for an incredible change in his life, a change that was permanent, a change that was exciting, a change that transformed his life both spiritually and physically. And this is exactly what we see, that we see very clearly that as John and Peter in verse 3 we see that these guys were set up by God. They were set up by God. It was a divine setup that God had in store for these guys. What perfect timing. God had a plan in his mind, and we see his plan coming to pass. Now, I want you to understand one thing, is that Peter and John were not miracle hunters. They were not looking for a miracle. They were not looking or walking around trying to say, hey, we have this power from Jesus. Let's go do some miracles, guys. They weren't doing that. They were going at the hour of prayer to witness to his own, their own people, but they did not have in mind, let's go do some miracles. Let's go do some signs and wonders. Those followed them. They didn't follow the miracles and signs. It wasn't until the Holy Spirit moved in the heart of Peter to do what he's about to do here in a moment that you're going to see. It was God's perfect timing. And you know what? This reminds me of the Christian life. It really does in some way. It reminds me of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Did you see that? God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has already prepared your steps for this week. And you're going to be walking into things that God prepared for you at work, at school, at home, You've been set up by God already. But it's a divine setup where you're going to be a witness, perhaps. Or you're going to pray for somebody. It's already been done for you. And as a faithful Christian, you're going to be walking into these works that God has already prepared beforehand. That's the power of God. That's, an, that's the amazing thing of God. But we see, though, that sometimes, you know, as, as Christians, and even, even as a non-Christian, you know, in life, we're always waiting for something. We're waiting for the right job. We're waiting for the right person to marry. You know, we're waiting for that problem to turn around. And when it's not happening, I guess, as fast as we would like, we get frustrated. We get bummed. You know, I was talking to a guy just recently, young guy, and he was basically telling me, and he was saying, you know what, I want to get married, and I haven't found a spouse. And I, I am so caught up with this that it's depressing me. I want to find a spouse. Ladies, it, no, I'm joking, no. Um, you're like, I'm right here. No, anyways. I, I, I encouraged them. I said, listen, be careful. Listen, the desire you have in your heart is a good thing. Because in the old time, back in the, in the beginning of time, God says it wasn't good for a man to be alone. So it's okay. The desire for you to have a, a wife is a God-given desire. Just be very careful in how you go about it. Wait for God's timing. How is that? I don't know. I don't know how that works. But I know that God is faithful. He's faithful to put things together in his time. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, He has made everything beautiful in what? In his time, not in our time. So here's this man who is crippled. Peter and John are coming, and they're meeting together. God's perfect time. The works that God prepared beforehand as John and, and Peter are walking in right now. Verse 4, notice what happens. And I love this part here. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Now, that is very important for us to understand here real quickly. We see here that he says he's fixing his eyes. Peter is staring at this guy. In fact, it's the same word used in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, when Jesus ascended to the Father. That angel said, why are you guys gazing up into, the, into heaven? I mean, why are you staring? The same word that is used here. It was a stare. He caught eyes with this guy. And the reason why this is very interesting is because beggars during this time, as it is in our day and age, 
they were not looked on. I mean, they, they, they ignored them. Nobody wanted to catch eyes with a beggar because if you did, then that means that you're going to give them something. Isn't that, isn't that the same with us today? When you walk by somebody who's, who's got a sign that says, I need money, I need help, or they approach you and you see them talking to somebody, you want to walk by quickly, right? Oh, I don't want to talk to them, right? But if you caught eyes with that guy or that woman, guess what? They're going to say, can you help me? And you see, for this beggar to catch eyes with, Jesus, or to, with Peter and for Peter to give him that attention, this guy said, yes, I just hit the jackpot. He's giving me something. This is awesome. But you see here, though, that this is not going to be the way he thinks it's going to be. He's given him his attention, but God is going to give him something better than money. And notice what it says in verse 5. He says, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something. The beggar expected the usual, money, to do whatever he was doing with the money. It was the right thing to do, and it was the right time. Everything said, I am going to receive something. You know, you've been in that position probably, and you know, when you're about to receive something, you're like, I, I can guarantee you I'm going to receive something right now. Let's say, for example, Christmas or your birthday, right? You expect gifts, don't you? Christmas gifts. And you know there's somebody in that family, there's always some, one person in that family that gives you the best gifts every year. You know that, right? That aunt, that uncle, you're like, every year, I can't wait for Christmas because last year they got me this, and this year it's going to be, and you're expecting it. Even though when you get to Christmas and that person gives you that gift, you humbly take it, oh, well, thank you. I, I thank you for thinking of me. Liar, you knew they were going to give you a gift. <laughs> but you know, it's just human nature, right? Like, oh, thank you. What happens if this year at Christmas time, that person that you're expecting a gift from decides not to give you a gift? And instead, they give you a hug. There's your Christmas gift. What would you say? Well, thank you. No, and now you're like, you'd be upset. Like, I can't believe it. I don't want a hug. Well, this guy, the beggar, expected money, but he wasn't going to get money. And Peter does it in a very interesting way. He says this in verse 6. He says, silver and gold I do not have. In other words, I'm broke, buddy. I don't have any money. That's my interpretation. And he says this, but what I do have, I give you. Well, what do you have? This guy must have been like, well, what do you have that's better than gold, silver and gold, you know? He says this, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You're like, well, can you just give me a buck? You know? It's like, really? I mean, think about it. Here he is. And we see that he is giving him something. He says, I don't have money, but what I do have is more valuable than silver and gold. Listen, guys, as a Christian, every Christian has some serious wealth. You're like, really? Have you seen my bank account, Rob? No, no, not that way. You have been blessed spiritually big time. Listen to this, Ephesians 1.3. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Listen, as Christians, you have a lot to count as far as blessings. You know, people say, well, count your blessings, count your blessings. Well, listen, as Christians, you have a lot of blessings to count. And listen to this, Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. So what he's saying in verse 6, he says, I have Jesus to give you. He says very clearly, in the name of Jesus. That means in the nature, in the character of Christ, who Jesus stands for. Well, what does that mean? Well, I am giving you a healing Jesus. I am giving you a loving Jesus. I have a compassionate Jesus. I have a merciful Jesus, a gracious Jesus, a forgiving Jesus, a Jesus who is powerful. That's who I have. You want him? Who wouldn't say no? I mean, here he is giving him something that is more powerful than silver and gold. And listen, guys, you guys have a lot to give too, and that's Jesus. You have Jesus to give. Well, why? Well, why is it? Because Jesus is the only hope for mankind, isn't, isn't he? I mean, he is the only hope for mankind. I, I don't care if this world's falling apart. As long as I have Jesus, I'm okay. Jesus Christ is the only hope for mankind. You know, I was getting a haircut, or before I was getting a haircut, I remember 
I was waiting for uh, the, the barber to come in. It was early before they opened up, but I got there early just to be the first one. It's kind of one of those first come, first serve kind of barber places. And, uh, and as I was there, I noticed this homeless guy was approaching me. He was coming towards me. So I went the other way and ran. No, I didn't do that, no. So I, I, I kind of turned towards him and I said, you know, and I just kind of gave him, you know, attention. And he asked me for money. He says, hey, can I have some money? And, and I said, I, I don't. I said, I don't have any money. But I said to him, listen, do you know Jesus? And he says to me, he goes, yes, I know. Okay, well, a lot of people know Jesus. They know of Jesus, but do you know Jesus? Have you received Jesus? Well, I have a few years ago. I said, and, I, and it gave me an opportunity to share Christ with this guy, to encourage this guy to get back into church, and encourage him to, to get plugged in. But you see, I did not have money, but I knew that the man's major need was Christ. And that's exactly what's happening here. I don't have money, but I have Christ. And, and notice what... Peter does. This is amazing. In verse 7, he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. I mean, could you imagine this crippled guy who's been crippled for a long time? According to Acts chapter 4, verse 22, he was over 40 years old. So for over 40 years, this guy was crippled. And yet Peter says, give me your hand, and he's lifting this guy up. If I was that beggar, I would have smacked his hands and said, stop that. I'm crippled. What are you doing? Don't mock me. But you see, what Peter was doing was, was a work of God. And this guy, though, had some kind of faith because he went along with it. And as he went along with it, he started to stand up. And this is what happens here. Notice immediately, the miracle was immediate. We see here very clearly that this happened right away. There was no gradual process. You know, sometimes when Jesus healed people, they, they got healed within the hour. Other times they were healed right on the spot, but, but most of the time it was all within the hour. This guy was right there, was on the spot. And notice how Luke, the doctor, describes this. His feet and ankle received strength. We see here very clearly that his ankle bones received miraculous strength for this guy to begin to walk. I wonder what it was like to take that first step. I mean, this guy's been crippled since birth. And could you imagine taking that first step walking. Your feet are strong. Your ankles are strong. It's just like when Peter walked on water for that very first time. You remember that? I wonder what it was like to walk on water. That first step that you take into that water is like just as solid as, as a rock, and you're starting to, you're walking on it. I mean, I wonder what it was like, but, but this guy was walking, and you're going to see by his reaction how excited he was that he actually could walk, that he could actually walk now. And we see, notice in verse 8, the healed man becomes a witness. It says this, So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Described in those three ways. We see his new condition is described by walking, leaping, and praising God. This was also an Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled in the eyes of the Jewish people. In Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6, it says, The lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. So Jesus is showing his power and fulfilling prophecy as well. But the leaping speaks of joy, excitement that Jesus brought in this man's life. We see like a child with a new toy, he could not resist using his newfound ability. He was excited. The other thing that's sad about this guy is that according to Old Testament law, this guy was blemished. He couldn't go in to worship with the rest of his peers. He was outside. Now he can go into the temple unblemished, not crippled. I mean, could you imagine the outlook of his, in his life and the things that God did in his life, the joy, the excitement? Do you get excited when God answers your prayers? Do you get excited when somebody gets saved in your family or perhaps a friend? Are you one of those that when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know that so-and-so got saved, you're like, oh, bummer. I didn't pray for them. <laughs> really? That guy's not going to hell anymore. <laughs> okay. I mean, do you get excited when God answers your prayer? Do you go like, yes, Lord, awesome. You intervened in my life. You're the God who created this heaven and this earth, and you thought of me. You came to me and you answered my prayer that's pretty big isn't it but sometimes we don't think that way we look at god as if, if god's just like one of us hey thanks god high five thank you no 
When God intervenes in your life and he answers a prayer or saves somebody who was so hard, you should be excited and full of joy that the God of this universe has intervened in that life. That's exciting. And that's exactly what this guy was showing. He was showing this outburst of praise because of what God did in his life. And we see here very clearly that this joy and excitement is something that God gave him. Now, if you've lost that joy, if you've lost that excitement, I encourage you to pray Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. When God does things, we should be excited. You remember Moses? When Moses was being chased by the Egyptians and he came to a dead end. And a lot of times we come to a dead end in life. You're like, God, what do I do here? Moses was in this place the river was flowing, the Red Sea, and, you know, he looks up to God and says, Lord, what do I do? I mean, what, he says, well, you see the staff in your hand? Yeah, lift it up. And the moment he did that, guess what? The whole sea parted, and he started going across this dry land, and the water is receded over on the side. It was just amazing, and he's walking across. When he gets to the other side, guess what he did? This is what he did. Exodus 15, verse 1 and 2 and 3. Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse, its rider, he has thrown into the sea. He is the Lord, my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. You see, on the other side of the river, of the Red Sea, there was nothing but fear. There's nothing but fear, a dead end. And sometimes you're, maybe you're in life right now and you're like, there's nothing but fear in your life. You're like, God, I don't know where to go from here. What, what do I do? Help me. Listen, God is going to help you. But when you get to the other side of your trial, of, of your situation, praise God. Worship him. Thank him. Just like these guys did. Because on the other side, there's joy and there's excitement. And sometimes the difficulties in our lives can take that joy and excitement that's, on, that's in our lives. But praising this here, we see this guy was praising. This should always be the, uh, the end result to any healing or miracle done by the Lord. The praises are always to God, not to man. Man should never be praised if God uses somebody to pray over you. And let's say you're healed or, or a prayer is answered through their prayer, whatever. Praises should always go to God, not to that person. And we see here this is exactly what he did. This man received a whole new life. His crippled condition was changed to walking. His hopeless attitude was changed to leaping. There was a joy. His spiritual condition was changed, and he was brought to faith in Christ as he began to praise God. So what does he do? He becomes a witness. Notice here, 9 and 10, verse 9 and 10. It says, all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was the one who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Crazy. Amazing. They connected the dots here. They saw the guy's like, mm, wait a minute, is that the guy that's been there for 40 some years? What? It's kind of like when somebody comes to you, like say you, you meet an old friend uh, that you used to party with, or, or you, you guys were together as non-Christians, you know, you weren't a Christian and all this, and, they, and then you run into them and they're like, is that you? Wait a minute, you're a Christian now? I, I remember what we used to do together. You're a Christian, really? That's pretty crazy. Or you have the same reaction when you find somebody, you meet somebody that you knew were, they, they were way out there in left field when it comes to the world, and now they're coming to you saying, praise the Lord. <laughs> what? Serious? What happened? Are you a robot now? Wh wh who are you? You know? And you find out that they've been saved. And this guy is being a witness. They're connecting the dots. They're saying, hmm, walking, you were crippled, now you're walking, and now you're praising God? Wait a minute, there's something here going on. And they knew that this was something beyond Peter and John. They noticed two things right away. The ability to walk and his ability to praise God, his new faith in Christ. This guy was radically changed and transformed. I want to close with a few thoughts here. I want to close with verse 5. Because verse 5 says here that this man expected to receive something. He had a daily routine, remember? This guy had a daily routine. He, he was put there, placed in front of this gate, day after day, he was there asking for money. Over 40 years, he was crippled, and he was doing this constantly. 
But this guy was going through the motions. He was just going through the motions in life. His expectation in life was very low. He was crippled. There's nothing he can do except ask for money, beg for money. And we see here that his condition kept him from experiencing more in life. And there could be some here tonight, today who, have, who are in the same spot as this crippled man. That you're just going through the motions in your Christian life. There's no excitement. There's no joy. You're just kind of there. You go to church. You listen to a sermon. You walk out. You go out to eat. You go home. You sleep. Wake up. Go to work. And you're just on this routine. And today God says, is saying to you, listen, I want to change your routine because it's not doing you any good. You're in a rut. I want to see more excitement, more joy in your Christian life. Or maybe you're not a Christian here today, and you're listening. They brought you in because it's Mother's Day. And you're here, you're listening, you're like, hmm, interesting. I didn't know about this Jesus well, listen, you're in the same condition as this crippled man, but spiritually. You're crippled. You can't walk. You can't walk with God right now. God wants to pull you out. He wants to pull you up from this spiritual condition. He wants to revive you spiritually. And Christian, the same with you. God wants to revive your heart. And if you're here, you're saying, I need a revival in my heart. I need a revival in my life. Listen to this. Psalm 119, 25. My soul clings to the dusts. Revive me according to your word. I believe God wants to revive hearts this morning. But the question is this, do you trust God? Do you really trust God with your life? Can you say honestly today, Lord, I need a revival. I need to be revived. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for a long time. And Lord, I just, I need revival. Because when we talk about revival, it starts with you. It starts with me. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. You're there and you're saying to yourself, I need a revival. I'm done with this daily routine. I want to know Jesus more. I want to learn more about him. I want to get to know him even more. And if you're not a Christian and you're saying, I want to know Jesus. My life is going nowhere. And I know Jesus, that, that he's the only hope that I have in this life. And then if that's you, you're going to be touched by the Holy Spirit. And he's going to call you to salvation.